Thank you, Brother Ryan, for leading us in those wonderful songs. If you have your Bible with you this morning, check it out, please. And go over into the book of Acts, to Acts the seventh chapter. Acts chapter 7, and I promise you in a few minutes we're going to read several verses out of Acts 7. It's good to see everyone here this morning. As the songs we sang suggest, this morning in our study, I want to talk with you. I want to talk with you about heaven. I want to talk with you about heaven. I want to know what is the first thing that pops into your mind whenever you think about and even sing about heaven. I ask you that question because unfortunately when it comes to heaven, for a lot of people, even for a lot of religious people, they have some very erroneous ideas. For example, for some people, whenever they think of heaven, they immediately think of that right there, right? They immediately think of a big pearly gate with Jesus or Peter or the Apostle Paul standing in front of that gate just waiting to let them in. Other people, whenever they think about heaven, they think about angels with wings flying around, blowing horns and, and trumpets and playing golden harps. And, and still other people, whenever they think about heaven today, they think about a fairy tale. In, in other words, for a lot of people, they don't even believe heaven is real. They don't even believe heaven exists. They believe that heaven is some, some made-up place like, like Never Never Land where Peter Pan lives or like Middle Earth and Lord of the Rings. Unfortunately for so many people, they have so many erroneous ideas about heaven. But here's the real question. The real question is, what about you? What do you believe? What do you believe about heaven? What do you believe heaven is going to be like? What do you believe heaven is going to look like and, and feel like? What do you believe about the emotions you may feel whenever you get there and, and realize that maybe some of your family members and friends did not make it? Let's just be honest about it, brothers and sisters. Those are exactly the kinds of questions that we typically have about Heaven, and unfortunately, I want you to know that for many of those questions, the Bible just doesn't give us answers to them. You see, we have to accept the fact, and I know this is hard for us to do, but we got to accept the fact that the purpose of the Bible is not to answer every trivial question we might have. The purpose of the Bible is not to answer every trivial question we may have about heaven. Instead, the purpose of the Bible is to reveal the scheme of redemption God has put in place to save us from our sins. That's the purpose of the Bible. The Bible doesn't tell us everything we want to know about heaven, but what it does do is it does give us a few facts. It does give us some information. It does tell us that heaven is going to be great and that we should want to be there above any other place. The Bible does tell us that heaven is going to be great. In fact, I want to submit to you this morning that there are at least four reasons why heaven is going to be great. There are at least four reasons why heaven needs to be our main goal and focus in life. And the first reason is this. The first reason why heaven is going to be great is because, brothers and sisters, heaven is where God lives. Heaven is where God lives. I want you to know that I'm going to tell you a lot of things about heaven this morning. I'm going to show you a lot of verses concerning what the Bible has to say about heaven, but I want you to know that out of all the things I tell you about heaven this morning, none of the points I give you will be able to top this point right here. None of the points I give you will be greater than this point right here. You see, out of all the things that makes heaven a great place to be, this right here is no doubt the top reason. This right here is no doubt the number one reason, the number one thing that makes heaven a great place to be is because heaven is where God lives. Heaven is where Jesus lives. Heaven is where the Holy Spirit lives. 
along with the faithful angels of God. God doesn't live on this earth. God lives in heaven, and we learn that all throughout the Bible. We learn that in the Old Testament. We learn that in the New Testament. We learn that in the Psalms. For example, in Psalm 115 in verse 3, in Psalm 115 in verse 3, the Bible says, but our God is in heaven, and he does whatever he pleases. Psalm 11 in verse number 4, the Bible says the Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. Notice not, it's not on the earth. It's in heaven. In Matthew chapter 6 and verse number 9, when teaching us how to pray, Jesus says when we pray, we ought to say our Father who is what? Our Father who is in heaven. In John chapter 14, verses 1 through 3, Jesus says that my father's house are many mansions or many dwelling places. When Jesus talks about the father's house there, he's, he's talking about heaven. His father's house is, is heaven. And then I want you to go to Acts 7. Are you in Acts chapter 7? Remember here in Acts 7, we can read about Stephen, a faithful Christian, being stoned to death because he preached the glorious gospel. He preached to the Jewish Sanhedrin council about Israel's constant history of rejecting the Lord. And after preaching that sermon that really condemned the Jewish people, in Acts chapter 7 and verse 54, it says, now when they heard this, verse 54, now when they heard this, they were cut to the quick and they began gnashing their teeth at him. But being full of the Holy Spirit, he gazed intently into heaven. He's got a vision of heaven here, and he saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens opened up and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. A couple of things I want you to notice from these verses. First, I want you to notice how contrary to what the skeptics may say. Contrary to what the critics of our faith may say, according to the Bible, heaven is is a real place. <coughs> Heaven is an actual place. It's not some made-up place like Never Never Land where Peter Pan lives. It's not some place that comes from man's imagination like Middle Earth and Lord of the Rings. No, according to what the Bible says, heaven is a real place. Heaven is an actual place. In fact, not only is it real and actual, but notice secondly how heaven is going to be a great place to be because that's where God reigns with his son, Jesus Christ. The Bible says that God reigns in heaven with his son, Jesus Christ. Christ, I got to tell you that this is something that we really got to emphasize. We really have to emphasize this because I have a fear, brothers and sisters. I have a fear that so often today, even as Christians, even as disciples of Jesus Christ, so often when we think about heaven, the first thing we tend to think about uh, is its beauty. Or we think about its provisions or we think about the fact that when we get to heaven, we're going to get to be reunited with our family members and our friends who have died in the Lord. So often today, whenever we think about heaven, those are the first kinds of things that pop into our mind. But I want you to understand this morning that even though we may think about those things, none of those things are the, are the greatest thing about heaven. The greatest thing about heaven is not that we're going to get to be reunited with our brethren who have died in the Lord. The greatest thing about heaven is not its beauty. It's not even its provisions. No, the greatest thing about heaven is the fact that heaven is where God is. God is in heaven. And when we get to heaven, guess what? We're going to get to be with God. We're going to get to be in the perfect presence of God. We're going to get to live with God in his house. We're going to get to behold God's everlasting glory. We're going to get to bow down before the throne of God. And we're going to get to worship and praise his, his glorious name, just like we can read about those in heaven doing in Revelation chapter 4. In heaven, we're going to actually get to bow down before the throne of God. And worship and praise his glorious name. We're going to get to be in perfect fellowship with God. We're going to get to regain what mankind lost in the Garden of Eden. 
In other words, in heaven, no longer will there be any separation between mankind and God. In heaven, we're going to be in perfect fellowship with God. We're going to be in the perfect presence of God. We're going to get to be with God and His Son and behold their glory as a spiritual family. That's the greatest thing about heaven. Wouldn't you agree? Heaven is great because that's where God is. That's where our Father is. But, but not only is heaven great because that's where the Father is and His Son, Jesus Christ. Another reason why heaven is great is because in heaven there's no wickedness. There's no wickedness. I mean, I think we can all agree that right now as we live on this earth, we're, we're surrounded. We are immersed with, with, with wickedness around us, right? I mean, there's wickedness around us all the time. I mean, currently we live in a world where more and more people are not even believing in God anymore. More and more people don't even believe in the first verse of the Bible, where the Bible says in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. There was a time where at least 90% of Americans believe that, but that number is shrinking each and every day. We even live in a world that is full of hate, and it's full of division and prejudice and, and greed. We live in a world where innocent people are murdered, where innocent little babies are murdered every single day and there is rape and sex trafficking and foul language and drugs and alcohol and false religion and false preachers all over the place. We live in a world that is just full of perversion and wicked behavior, but thankfully, brothers and sisters in heaven, we're not going to have to deal with that anymore. Thankfully in heaven, we're not going to have to worry about seeing and experiencing the promotion of evil. You see, in heaven, there's not going to be any cursing. There's not going to be any foul speech. There's not going to be any homosexuality. And, and, and abortion and, and rape and drunkenness and backbiting and betrayal and, and prejudice and false teaching. In heaven, we're not going to have to worry about experiencing any kind of wickedness. And one of the reasons why is because in heaven, there's not going to be any devil. There's not going to be any Satan. There's not going to be any spiritual lion prowling around seeking who he may devour. The devil's not going to be in heaven, my friends. And that's something else I want to emphasize to you, because contrary to what you may believe and contrary to what you may be hearing from those in our culture, the devil is real also. The devil is alive and he's well today. He continues to assault the people of God. He continues to hate us. He continues to do all he can to cause us to lose our souls. That's the facts. The devil is after us. He's responsible for all this wickedness we see in our world today. But thankfully in heaven, we're not going to have to deal with him anymore. According to Revelation 20, verse 10, the Bible says the devil's not going to be in heaven. Instead, he's going to be thrown into the lake of fire where he's going to suffer forever. Heaven is a great place to be because there's not going to be any devil. And another thing we need to point out is heaven is a great place to be because there we're going to experience a new order of things. A new order of things. Someone says, well, where are you getting that idea from? Well, look at what Peter says in 2 Peter. 2 Peter chapter 3. Look at verse 10. In 2 Peter chapter 3 and, and, and verse number 10, Peter says, 2 Peter 3, 10, But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, in which the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat, and the earth and its works will be burned up. Says all these things ought to be destroyed in this way. What sort of people are you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be destroyed by burning and the elements will melt with intense heat? But according to his promise, we're looking for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. A couple of things I want you to notice here. First, notice how according to verse 10, the Bible makes it very clear that the day of the Lord is going to take place. The day of the Lord is going to occur 
like a thief. The Lord is going to come back. And on that day when he comes back, planet Earth will be no more. And it's going to be burned up. It's going to be destroyed with fire. That's what the Bible says is going to happen. And because that's going to happen. In verse 11, Peter says that needs to motivate us to live a certain way. That needs to motivate us to be holy in our behavior, to, to be godly people and hastening the day in which we're going to experience new heavens and a new earth. Do you see that? My friends, when Peter mentions new heavens and new earth there, please understand that, that he's not talking about God literally creating a new planet earth, okay? He, he's not using literal language there. Instead, he's using figurative language to talk about a new order of things. He is talking about us looking forward to a day. When this wicked world is gone and we get to go to heaven and experience blessings and a new way of living that we've never experienced before. We're going to experience a new order of things. In fact, part of this new order of things includes being in a place where there's no more sin. No more wickedness, no more temptation. Remember, Peter says there that heaven is a place where righteousness, not unrighteousness, dwells, right? Hey, it's going to be a great place to be because when we get there, we're not going to have to see and experience wickedness anymore. And, and then a third reason why heaven is going to be great is because there we're going to receive our reward. We're going to receive our reward from God. Are you still in Peter's epistles? Look at 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse number 3. 1 Peter 1 and verse Number three, we read this in our Bible class a few, a few classes ago where Peter says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Verse four, to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away Reserved where? Reserved in heaven for you. For you. Notice how the Bible says here that when it comes to our ultimate prize, our ultimate reward, our, our inheritance, the Bible says that's, that's heaven. He heaven is our inheritance. Heaven is our reward. And someone says, well, Sean, what exactly does that reward involve? Well, I want to suggest that that reward in heaven actually involves several things. First, our reward in heaven involves rest. It involves spiritual rest. Remember, Revelation 14 and verse 13 says, blessed are those who die in the Lord, because from now on they get to what? They get to rest from their labor. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 9, that the Hebrew writer says that there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. And we should be diligent to enter into that rest. When the Hebrew writer talks about a Sabbath rest there, he's talking about heaven. He's saying that if you're tired, if you're tired in this life right now, if you're tired of going through problems, if you're tired of having trials and tribulations, if you're tired of being persecuted for your faith, if you're tired of being discouraged, if you're tired of fighting the devil and have people hurt you and let you down, if you're tired of going through that stuff, the Hebrew writer says you need to be faithful to God and go to heaven because in heaven you're going to get rest. Our reward includes rest. And it also includes glory. Glo glory in the sense that when we get to heaven, we're going to be glorified as we reign with our master and savior, Jesus. Look at Romans, Romans, the eighth chapter. I'm going to Romans chapter eight. Look at verse number 16, please. Romans, the eighth chapter. And here the apostle Paul says this in verse 16. In verse 16, he says, the spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God and of children of God, heirs also, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, 
if indeed we suffer with him, so that we may also be what? Be glorified with him. Notice how the Bible says that when we get to heaven, we're going to receive glory. We're going to be glorified with Jesus as we reign as joint heirs with him. Wow, what a blessing that is. We're going to be glorified in heaven. In fact, part of the glory we're going to receive includes the, the very bodies God is going to give us. Did you know you're going to be given a new body when you, when you go to heaven? That's what the scripture says. Then we read that in Philippians chapter 3. I hope you pay close attention to that because we read those verses for a reason. Philippians 3 and verse 21. After talking about how our citizenship is in heaven, in Philippians 3 and verse 21, it says, who will transform the body of our humble estate into the conformity, into conformity with the body of his glory. We're going to have a glorified body like Jesus by the extortion of the power that he has even to subject all things to himself. Now, now put that what you find in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I told you we were going to have a lot of verses this morning, so I hope you, hope you got your Bible. A lot of verses we're looking at. Look at 1 Corinthians 15 and verse, verse 50. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 50. Paul says, now I say this, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot enter cannot inherit, rather, the kingdom of God. So we can't go into heaven looking like this. Nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable. And we will be changed, for this perishable must put on the imperishable in this mortal Let's put on immortality. We got to put on immortality to enter into heaven. Paul says that when we get to heaven, we're going to be clothed a certain way. We're going to be clothed with immortality. Practically speaking, that means we're going to be given different bodies. Unlike the physical bodies we have now, our spiritual bodies are going to be immortal. They're going to be forever strong forever young, forever glorious, forever incapable of experiencing pain. They're not going to require surgeries or expensive medications. They're not going to be subject to ulcers or cancer or diabetes or aches and pain. They're not going to be able to get the flu or even the coronavirus. They're not going to be subject to death. And all the rigors that our bodies have to go through in this life. Paul says the bodies we're going to be given when we go to heaven will be forever strong, incorruptible, imperishable, glorious like Jesus. Our reward involves new bodies. And our reward also involves being in our true home. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 8. There Paul says we prefer to be absent from the body and at home with the Lord. Philippians 3 and verse 20, what did Paul say? Our citizenship, our citizenship is in heaven. You see, while we live in this world right now, while this world is beautiful, while it does contain sun glory, while it may be fun at times, we got to always remember as Christians that this world is not our home as we sing, right? This world is not our true home. This world is not our true country. Instead, heaven is our true country. Heaven is our true home. Heaven is the place we should want to be even above living in this world because that's where our Father is. That's where our Savior is, Jesus Christ. In heaven, we're going to receive all of these great things that make up our reward. And, you know, the really awesome thing about all these, these things God is going to give us, the really awesome thing about, about our reward is we're going to get to experience it forever. Forever. Matthew 25, verse 46. Remember, Jesus said, after he said that those who go to hell are going to experience everlasting punishment, 
when he talks about the righteous, he says we're going to receive everlasting, not temporary, everlasting life. Put that what Paul says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 15, as Paul talks about what's going to happen when the Lord comes back. In verse 15, he says, for this we say to you by the word of the Lord. This is coming from God. That we who are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain we be called together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we shall, here's the key part, we shall what? Always. We shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort each other with these words. Notice how unlike the pleasures we enjoy in this life from time to time. The Bible says the pleasures of heaven are everlasting. They're eternal. Paul said that when we get to heaven, we're going to always get to be with the Lord. That means we're not going to have to worry about getting to heaven and God one day kicking us out. We're not going to have to worry about God evicting us. We're not going to have to worry about saying goodbye to each other or watching the clock or worrying about all good things coming to an end. No, when we get to heaven, my friends, we're going to be there forever. We're going to be there for eternity. We're never going to have to leave. Now, these are just four things, just four things that make heaven great. And regardless of what view you hold in the last two chapters of Revelation, I know brethren are sometimes divided on that, whether you think the last two chapters of Revelation are talking about heaven or talking about the glorious church. Regardless of the review you hold on that, these things I just shared with you, they're, un, they're undeniable. They're, they're indisputable. You, you, they're clear and easy to see. But here's my question. My real question is this. How bad do you want this stuff? How, how bad do you want to go to heaven? How bad do you really want to receive your reward? I want to suggest... That if you really want to go to heaven, you do at least three things. And for those who put your Bibles away, get them back out because we ain't done just yet, okay? <laughs> if you really want to go to heaven, you'll do at least three things. The first thing you'll do is you'll set your treasures in heaven. You'll put your treasures in heaven. Look at Matthew chapter 6. Matthew 6, verse 19. Jesus said, Matthew 6, 19, do not store for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in or steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. I want you to pay close attention to verse 19 where Jesus says, do not store, do not store for yourselves treasures on earth. Do you see that? When Jesus says do not store up treasures for yourself on earth, he's not saying that it's wrong to have earthly treasures. He's not saying it's wrong to have a nice house and a nice car and money in your bank account. That's not the point he's making here. He's not saying it's wrong to have earthly riches. Instead, he is saying that earthly riches should not be your top priority in life. Earthly riches should not be your main priority. Focus in life instead of making pursuing earthly riches your main focus in life. Jesus says you need to make storing up spiritual treasures your main focus in life. You need to do things like pray without ceasing. And read and study your Bible every day and seek after the lost and love people and help people and serve people. You see, when you do stuff like that, you're storing up for yourselves treasures in heaven and Jesus says that needs to be our top priority in life. And so those who want to go to heaven will do that. They'll put their treasures in heaven. But not only will they store up treasures in heaven, the second thing they'll also do is they'll think about heaven all the time. 
How often do you think about heaven? How often do you think about heaven on a daily basis? In Colossians chapter 3 and verse number 2, the Apostle Paul says, set your mind on the things above and now on the things on the earth. Like in the case of Jesus in Matthew 6, we got to understand that when Paul says what he says in that verse, he's really using what is called elliptical language to emphasize one thing while at the same time de-emphasizing something else. When he says, do not set your mind on the things of the earth, he's not saying that it is a sin to think about things on the earth. He's not saying that he doesn't understand that as human beings, sometimes we got to think about stuff in this in this life. He's not saying that it is a sin to think about things of the world. Instead, he's making the point that the things of the world should not be the main thing that consumes our thoughts. It should not be the main thing that is consuming our hearts instead of allowing the things of the world to consume our minds and our hearts. Paul says we need to allow heaven to consume those things. In other words, we need to be thinking about heaven all the time. We need to be thinking about heaven in the morning. We need to be thinking about heaven when we're at work. We need to be thinking about heaven when we're exercising and walking the dog and, and even right before we go to bed at night. You see, people who really want to go to heaven, they think about heaven all the time. It's constantly on their mind. And, and, and thirdly, not only do they think about heaven, but those who really want to go to heaven, they also do what it takes to make it to heaven. They also surrender themselves completely to the will of God. One more place and then we're going to get ready to close. Matthew chapter 7. You're still in the gospel of Matthew. Look at Matthew 7 and verse 21. Matthew 7 and verse 21. Jesus says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who's in heaven will enter. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? And in your name cast out demons, and in your name perform many miracles, and then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. But you notice how in verse 21 here, Jesus tells us exactly who's going to go to heaven. He tells us exactly who's going to go to heaven, and it's not just those who, who merely believe in him. It's not just those who merely call him Lord. No, in this verse, Jesus says that the people who are going to actually make it to heaven are those who do something. It's those who do the will of the Father. Do you see that? Don't misunderstand what Jesus means when he uses that language. When Jesus says we got to do the will of the Father in order to go to heaven, he's not saying that we could earn our way into heaven. He's not saying that we can merit our way into heaven. Let me tell you something, brothers and sisters. I don't care how good of a person you may think you are. There's no possible way that you could ever earn your way into heaven because at the end of the day, you've sinned against God. You've sinned against God. I've sinned against God. We've all sinned against God. And so when we make it to heaven, it's not going to be because we're so good or because we're so holy or because we're so righteous. Instead, it's going to be because God is so good and God is so holy and God is so righteous. It's going to be because of God's love and his mercy and his forgiveness and his grace. When Jesus says we got to do the will of God in order to go to heaven, he's not talking about earning our salvation. Instead, he's just talking about surrendering completely to the will of God. He's talking about obeying God and being faithful to God. He's talking about having reverence for God and coming to him on his terms. He's talking about doing things like believing in Jesus. And repenting of our sins and being baptized in water for the forgiveness of our sins. He's talking about doing things like loving all people. And worshiping in a way that pleases him. And striving to grow spiritually in the faith. And being sexually pure. 
and striving to be holy and striving to honor those that he says that we need to honor and serve one another and, and help each other and behave in a godly manner at all times. Those are the kinds of things that God in his word tells us to do over and over again. And if we really want to go to heaven, when we read that stuff, we won't just read it. We won't argue about God's commandments. We won't quibble over them. We won't treat them as some sort of buffet line. Instead, we'll just apply them. We'll just do what God says we need to do. This is what the scripture says about heaven. So again, how bad do you want to go to heaven? How bad do you want to go to heaven? You know, the really great thing about heaven, in addition to the things we've talked about, is Jesus came into this world and died on a cross so that we all can go to heaven. Heaven is not just for a select few like the Calvinists say. No, heaven is for anybody who's willing to submit to God and do his will. And so if there's somebody here this morning who needs to respond to the gospel and do the will of God through faith and repentance and baptism, or if you need to come back to your father because you know you can't make it to heaven without him, whatever spiritual needs you may have this morning, we want to help you go to heaven. And we'll do that right here and right now as we stand and we sing together.